This week on Jerusalem Dateline, he called it a miracle. See how this grocery clerk used the shopping cart to stop terrorists. Plus, Iraqi Christians are beginning a new life in a new land. And watch the remarkable story of Israelis helping Syrian and Middle East refugees. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israel is stepping up security at Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria as the settlements have become popular for Palestinian terror attacks. But in one of the latest incidents, a grocery store owner stopped an attack by using a shopping cart. He called it a miracle. As Julie Stahl reports, it's one bright spot in the midst of many tragedies. Beit Haron is the third settlement hit by terrorists. They've breached security and killed two women in separate attacks. First mother of six, Daphna Meir, was murdered defending her home in Otniel. Then 23-year-old Shlomit Kriegman was murdered in Beit Haron. One incident, however, could have been much worse. This is the security fence of Beit Haron. Until now, it's kept the 2,000 residents of this community safe. In a well-planned attack, two terrorists jumped the fence, hurled pipe bombs at residents, then headed for this grocery store. One of uh, my workers see the attack outside, run into sh the shop and scream, terrorists, they kill a lady outside. Grocery store owner Mordecai Shalem took action to avert an even bigger tragedy. A security camera captured his heroic effort. I take the carriage and when I get to the door, I see in front of me two guys with a knife screaming, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, try to stab me. Just what run in my head, it's don't let them get in. I have in the shop something like 10 children and ladies, not men in the shop, so it's, it's a miracle. Miracle that they stop outside. Yigal Dilmoni, a leader in the Jewish communities here, says Israel needs to do more to keep the settlement safe. Stop the terror. We have to get inside their towns, catch them and find them, like the United States doing after 9-11. More than 400,000 Israelis live in 150 communities in what's known to many as the occupied West Bank. In a statement that some believe excuses the terrorists, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon indicated he understood the Palestinian attacks because of what he called Israel's occupation in the West Bank. If men like him, that in charge of the peace on the world, understand the killer and the murder, I think he's a partner to the murder. Founded in 1977, Beit Haron is built where the biblical town of the same name was situated. Resident and first responder Yudit Tayar says it's part of the divine inheritance of the Jewish people. This land has belonged to us since the Bible. Yes, we were evicted, thrown out of our land um, very brutally, dispersed among the nations, but all through the thousands of years, every prayer, no matter where the Jew is in the world, he talks about the return to Zion, to our eternal homeland. Julie Saul, CBN News, Beit Haron. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu accused UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of giving a tailwind to terror. Ban Ki-moon condemned Palestinian terrorism, but he also said what he called Israel's occupation serves as a potent incubator of hate and extremism. Netanyahu reacted angrily. Those Palestinians who murdered do not want to build a state. They want to destroy a state and they say this openly. They want to murder Jews for being Jews and they say this openly. They do not murder for peace and they do not murder for human rights. Netanyahu said the UN lost its neutrality years ago and the Secretary General's statements don't approve the situation. Well, as temperatures dropped this week in Jerusalem, Israel's electrical grid experienced a major cyber terror attack. Israeli energy officials say the virus was identified, but according to the Jerusalem Post, they haven't figured out what caused it. The announcement was made during the third annual CyberTech conference, an event that draws the world's leaders in cyber technology. No word on any suspects behind the cyber crime. Islamic State militants in Iraq are continuing their campaign to destroy any evidence of Christianity in that country. New satellite images show the Islamic army demolished one of the oldest monasteries in the world in 2014. Heather Sells has the latest. 
During the summer of 2014, it took only a few weeks for the Islamic State to literally pulverize the stone in this centuries-old monastery. There's nothing left. Small piles of rocks, perhaps, but nothing that would look like the monastery. Before its destruction, St. Elijah's Monastery stood on a hill above Mosul. Although the roof was largely missing, it had 26 distinct rooms, including a sanctuary and a chapel. Exiled Mosul priest Paul Habib says the destruction is part of a systematic campaign to expel Christians from Iraq. Our Christian history in Mosul is being barbarically leveled. Already, the Islamic State has destroyed more than 100 religious and historic sites as it has taken control of parts of Syria and Iraq. Ironically, its destruction of St. Elijah's comes after a recent preservation effort. When the U.S. Army took control of the site in 2003, a military chaplain recognized its significance. They are very um, non-renewable resources. Once they're gone, they're gone forever, and while you can reconstruct a building, um, it, it loses its historic fabric. Many had wondered about the fate of the monastery after ISIS swept through Mosul in June of 2014. The new imagery shows the destruction took place just two months later. The Syrian Christian monk Saint Elijah built the monastery between 582 and 590 A.C. Heather Sell, CBN News. While Americans debate their immigration policies, the people of the Czech Republic have just welcomed some Iraqi Christian asylum seekers into their country. One of those include a close friend of CBN News, Pastor Majid Cordy. He worked with us in 2014 after ISIS took over much of northern Iraq. And again, just a few months ago, he took us to the front lines of the Kurdish military and to visit refugee camps. I would add that many of these Christian families, like Pastor Majid, they covet prayers for their transition to a new life in an unfamiliar land. Gary Lane has their story. The first of a group of 153 Iraqi Christians arrived in Prague on Sunday. Among them was Kurdish Christian Majid Kurdi and his family. We have come here first to, to uh, provide a secure life for our families and secondly to uh, get a job and doing uh, something here in order to serve the society as well as to take care of our families. Majid Kurdi is well known to this reporter and others from CBN News. In this story from 2014, Kurdi assisted CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell on his visit to Iraqi Kurdistan. He told Mitchell that ISIS gave the Christians of Mosul three choices. They are not allowed to open their churches, and even if they, they opened, uh, they are going to, to burn the churches. And also, they, the Christians being asked to pay the tax. If not, they can leave Nineveh, and if they didn't left and they didn't pay the tax, they should give their heads. And now, with his family in Prague, Kurdi says other Iraqi Christians need asylum in the West because they're suffering for their faith. Being a Christian in Iraq means giving your life. And living under the fields and camps in Iraq is something really, really hard for the Christians. And at a time when many Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers are being viewed with suspicion in Europe and elsewhere, the head of the Barnabas Fund praised the Czech Republic for opening its doors. I want to pay tribute to the vision and bravery of the Czech Republic government in recognizing that Christians are uniquely targeted and abandoned by the international community. Gary Lane, CBN News. Coming up, we'll take you to the Island of Tears, where scores of Syrian refugees are arriving on the shores of Greece every day. The last people they expect to see are waiting to rescue them. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dayline. It's one of the biggest humanitarian disasters in recent history. Every day, boatloads of refugees arrive on the shores of Greece. They're hoping to find a new start in Europe. And when they arrive, some of the first people they meet are doctors and rescue teams from Israel. CBN's Gordon Robertson brings us their story. the Greek island of Lesvos, a quiet vacation spot where tourists relax. 
and local children play in peace. But on the other side of the island, a very different scene is unfolding. Every day, thousands of refugees arrive on this shore. Most are fleeing the Syrian civil war, hoping to resettle in Europe. We see babies which are only a few days old, old people at the age of 90, 95 even. And we get mainly people from Syria, also from Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran. Waiting to help them on the beaches of Greece are the last people the Syrians might expect. Volunteers from Israel. My name is Tali Shaltiel. I'm here with Israel, an Israeli-based NGO. My name is Majida Kardosh. I'm here as a medical team. I work as a nurse. My name is Iris Adler. I live in Tel Aviv. I just finished med school in Tel Aviv University. I came here uh, through Israel to be on the coast as a doctor. My name is Manal Shadi. I'm from Nazareth and I'm the team lead of Israel in Greece. The Israel team is a mix of doctors and nurses, both Arab and Jewish. I am a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Arabic is my mother tongue. I'm also a Christian, so I'm a minority inside of a minority inside of Israel. Being aware of my history, my background, where I come from, the history that my people went through, this is something that appeals to me. I mean, I can help refugees, so this is my job and this is what I should be doing. Our job here is to receive the boats of the refugees that are coming from the Turkish side to the Greek side. There are many, many volunteers on the beach, not many medical teams. On the line from the Turkish side, they're going through a lot of problems. Their smugglers there are asking them to pay between a thousand to five thousand dollars per person. A lot of time they're just shoving them into boats that should fit 50 people, but there are 150 people on the boat. They just leave them midway through the sea and they tell them, you find your own way to Greece, we're not responsible on you. Or they put, they fill like half a tank of gas and they just leave them in the middle of the sea. And what we do is go to Hind Point with binoculars, searching and scanning the water, and you start looking for this black with orange dots in the view. And then it comes nearer and you start seeing the rubber boat and all the people on it. It's like one, two, three, it begins. It's a few minutes of chaos, taking off the babies, people screaming, shouting helping them, you know, a lot of them don't know how to swim, they're afraid from the water. Here is the point that we start doing a triage, a very fast, you know, by hearing, they're talking, looking at the refugees, so we can see who is in need of medical help, and I start shouting, Min badu doctor, who need a doctor in Arabic? And so this is the time that we start giving treatment. I've treated 14-year-old Afghani guy that was unconscious. If he didn't receive aggressive treatment on the shore, on the spot, he might have not made it. After that, we start giving them food and water, warm clothes, something to eat, to drink, because some of them didn't have any water or food for like one or two days. After that, I take the map. We have a map that we translate on it in Arabic explain to them what is the next step. You know, they don't know where they are, okay? I, so the first thing that I tell them that they are in Lesbos Island in Greece, because some of them, they had like no idea where they are. Most of them, they had nothing. They just come with their clothes only because they had to throw their bags in the sea or smugglers took their bags and threw in the sea. After a couple of days of assessing the field, we understood that the biggest need is a way to communicate with the refugees who come. So we brought a team from Israel, which is Arab speaking, and the effect was amazing. Hearing your language is very important to them. 
and then getting the instructions where to go, what to do next, what are the next steps, because they have a lot of uncertainty. And although Israel and Syria are technically at war, none of that matters here on the beach. Usually when they get to the beach, they're just happy to see people waiting for them, giving them help and food and clothes and medical treatment if they need. Sometimes they realize who we are and they, they're just happy to see us and they hug us and kiss us and it's very exciting. We get lovely, warm, like warming reactions of hugs and, you know, men kissing me like I'm their daughter, you know, on the forehead saying thank you, saying that I would never have thought that I'm going to receive treatment or be able to speak to, from an Israeli doctor or share my story with an Israeli who will empathize with what I've been through. This guy, he had, I think, a sprained ankle and he put some bandage and I wanted to take out of my bag some medicine to ease the pain, a painkiller. And uh, while I'm looking in my bag, this guy asked uh, Majda in Arabic, where am I from? Like, where is she from? Where is she from? And she was telling to him, what does it matter? You need help now, she's here to give it to you. Why are you focusing on that? And we continue with our work and whatever we were doing uh, at the time. And a few minutes afterwards, he comes to, uh, to me with a package of biscuits that he brought from Turkey for the journey. You know, giving me something from the nothing that he have and apologizing um, for not respecting me or questioning me. Um, and, you know, just giving me, you know, a thanks for being there. So who is Israel? Up next, we'll show you more about this remarkable group of people and how they're helping refugees in crisis. Welcome back. The Islamic State has devastated Syria and northern Iraq, destroying millions of lives. Hundreds of thousands of survivors have fled to Europe, risking everything in the hope of finding safety. As we reported before the break, one group that's helping those refugees is called Israel. Gordon Robinson brings us the conclusion of that report. Israel is an political organization. What they do is help people in a disaster situation. And this is what I'm doing. And this is what they teach me at nursing school, to treat a human, no matter what he is, which religious he have, which color he is, what, what language he talks. To see a 60-year-old Arab man burst into tears on the shore, something that you don't see every day. So being able to give a hand, give a hug, give water, medical treatment, that's yeah, a privilege. Offshore, Israel aid doctors also provide trauma counseling for families in refugee camps. We start with the communication thing, talking Arabic, or put only hand on, on his or her shoulder try to make them feel better, you know, as much as we can. In my country, in Syria, it's uh, coming very hard and there's no future for anyone. Yesterday, I have come here with a plastic boat. I will say that uh, they are amazing people and uh, I'm really, really thanks everyone working with these people. They are really helping us and helping a lot of families here and children. Because we come from a country that a lot of people suffer trauma because of the conflict and what's happening, so we have a lot of experience how to deal with trauma, how to deal with the conflict. And this is the knowledge that we need to pass to other people, to other countries, if we can help make their suffering less, or to help support them, or to show them a different way. And I think this is our duty. These people come and they automatically get this title. They are refugees fleeing to Europe. But then at the end of the day, they're just humans, the families. They had honorable jobs, fulfilling life in the countries that they're coming from. And suddenly they come here and they're treated and looked as refugees when they're human beings as me and you. And for me, when I 
meet those people. This is what I'm trying to give them, that feeling that I respect them, I feel them, I connect to them in the most human level. I'm not above them or same, it's just now they're on that side of the coin. Tomorrow it might be me and I will need their help. I was thinking about that 60 years ago, which was the Jewish people in Europe during the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, making their journey to Israel or for different countries and seeking for a safe home. We're always saying, never again. When you see something difficult, for me, it's looking at my part. What's my responsibility? This is what we try to do, you know. We're coming as humans, meeting other human beings, and this is how changes starts. Little. They are very lovely. They are give me hope to my future. They are really cool people. <laughs> I think that helping other people is a very important thing in the Jewish tradition. We can't just sit back and watch what's going on. We have to come and do the best we can. And even if we touched a few people's lives, I think that's a lot. Up next, remembering the Holocaust and the people who helped them escape. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. This week marks 71 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp in Poland. January 27th, is now known as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The United Nations wants member nations to honor the victims of the Nazi era. That information comes from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has also posted videos depicting stories of rescue, how brave people throughout Europe risked so much to help Jews against the Nazis during World War II. But I feel it's very important to know that people risk their lives they risk the lives of their families. You can find out more about the events and watch these videos by going to cbnnews.com. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. <laughs>